video will explain a study on using self-supervised learning with GANs to stabilize training and prevent catastrophic forgetting and cyclic uh, problems with training GANs. So the headline idea is that this paper utilizes the rotation self-supervision task to rival supervised GANs, where you use the class labels on GANs. And obviously we want to get away from doing supervised learning with GANs because GANs are a useful unsupervised learning technique for feature extraction and also in vision in general, we have access to enormous image data sets and we can't possibly label all the data. So this technique is going to improve image generation and the representation quality of when you use this as a technique to train classification models. So rotation classification is, is one of the most popular self-supervised learning tasks in addition to things like relative patch location, colorization, and uh, maybe like super resolution and these jigsaw puzzle kind of things. But so the idea is basically you take an image and then you either don't rotate it at all or you rotate it at 90, 180, or 270 degrees. And then you'd have a network predict how much the image has been rotated. So they're going to integrate uh, this part of the rotation task within the GAN framework. So GANs already work where the generator produces a fake image and then uh, a real image is sampled from the data set. And then the discriminator is going to tell a real fake based on these two. But now what it's going to do is the images are going to go into this pipeline and they're going to be rotated. So the discriminator is classifying them as real or fake, but it's also predicting the rotation of the image. So the original GAN objective is this loss, where you have the expectation that the sample is from the data set and that you predicted that correctly, or that it's from the generator and you predicted that correctly. So what we're going to do to modify it with uh, the self-supervision task is in the generator loss, you add uh, the success of the discriminator in predicting the rotation on the generated image. The x from P to G means x sampled from the generator. And then, you know, the prediction of the rotation angle, you know, rotation equals R given this image. And then on the discriminator side, you have uh, the losses, the sample from the data set, and then the loss on this. So the discriminator isn't actually updated with how successfully it predicts the rotation on the generator. So for this reason, it's called collaborative adversarial learning because the generator has the discriminator's rotation success in its loss term. So it's in the best interest of the generator to produce images that the discriminator can successfully classify the rotation angle of. So this is an interesting idea that they, the generator and the discriminator are adversarial with respect to the real fake task, but then they also have this other thing that they're doing together in a way. So the motivation for this is catastrophic forgetting and deep learning. And this uh, image here isn't from a GANs, it's from a classifier. So what happens is they train the model on the task of, of classifying one class from the CIFAR 10 data set, and then they switch the class. And every time they do this and switch the classes, you see this downward spike as the discriminator, I mean, as the classifier no longer has the kinds of representations to classify these images. So see uh, here, it is probably classifying like cats, images of cats, and then it goes to dogs or something. So in GANs, we have cyclic training. This is one of the most common failure modes in addition to like mode collapse and the discriminator like dominating the generator. So imagine that the generator, uh, the discriminator sends a signal and the generator jumps from this kind of distribution to this one. And then the discriminator fails at this one because it's completely forgotten about this. So it jumps back to this and then it continues this cycle forever. And that's because the discriminator, as the generator starts producing like this B set, the discriminator is completely forgotten about A, and then it learns all about B. So the generator goes to C, and then some, and then it goes back to A to fool the discriminator because the discriminator can't continually learn the changing distribution of the generated samples compared to the real data set. So an additional motivation is, let's say that you've got the optimal discriminator at convergence where the generated data distribution is identical to the original data distribu distribution. The discriminator at this point just outputs 0 0.5 regardless of the input because, you know, if you predict a generated sample, it, overly confident predictions will kill it. So it'll just do 0 0.5, like, I don't know, I don't know, every time. So when this happens, if you take these representations from the discriminator and use it for as features for a classification model, they get really bad because the discriminator no longer has a sense of visual representation because it's just outputting 0 0.5 regardless of the input. So these are the initial results of the self-supervised GAN and this modulation uh, and the modification to batch normalization. 
compared to conditional GANs and then unconditional GANs. So we see already that the self-supervised GAN is outperforming the unconditional GAN, which is just a GAN without uh, the rotation task. And the conditional GAN is the GAN, but with the class labels. So now they're going to scale it up. They're going to use the big GAN model, which is an enormous uh, generative adversarial network model. They're going to use an enormous amount of computational resources with 128 of the Google TPU V3 pods. And then they're going to increase the batch size uh, up to 2048. So using this, they're also going to search for some hyperparameters on the gradient penalty and spectral normalization, which control the like Lipschitz constant of the discriminator, basically a function to make sure, I mean, a limit, like a normalization method to make sure the discriminator doesn't become too strong for the generator. And then they also uh, iterate on the hyperparameter of how many training steps should the discriminator have per generator set because the discriminator is so heavily normalized with these gradient penalties and spectral normalizations that sometimes you might want to run it for twice to catch up. So these are the, some of the samples found from their best model in the ImageNet. These are pretty convincing results given that there was no labels provided to the network. And then this is the, they use the FID metric for, uh, you know, presenting the quality of their generated samples. And on this metric, the lower score is a better score. So this just shows like as it's training, you know, you sample some of it and then you calculate the score. So you see on ImageNet how the unconditional GAN collapses. And this is a, like a failure mode. This would be a really high score. And then this is the rotation quality showing that, you know, when you, t when you train the uh, GAN and then you take the discriminator's visual representations and use that to train a classifier, you see that when you use rotation only, the self-supervised task, or this one, you get about 20%. 20, uh, 20%. Unconditional does horribly. And then the uh, conditional GAN doesn't perform as well as the self-supervised GAN for the task of representation quality, which may really be the most, in, most important application of GANs is whether you can use it to, for unsupervised learning for classifiers, object detectors, and miscellaneous computer vision tests. So this is the CIFAR-10 classification accuracy, about 80%, pretty similar to the others though on CIFAR-10, but on ImageNet, it's much different. It's much higher than uh, unconditional or rotation only and a little bit higher than conditional. So this is a comparison of the self-supervised GAN with other unsupervised learning techniques. And this by GAN model was recently improved with a big GAN model as well and does outperform this. And it's just interesting to see all these different techniques that uh, people are coming up with to make use of unlabeled data for representation learning. So thanks for watching this video on self-supervised GAN. Again, please subscribe to Henry AI Labs for more deep learning videos.